Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. Everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show, show 350. Last week, Gary did show 1001, and he took, what, six years off? Anyway, uh, in honor of Gary and his, I'm assuming, one episode return, because it didn't look like he has anything put out since then, I'm wearing the whole Vaniac regalia. I think I'm missing one, not missing, I, don't th I think I did not get one of the wristbands i think he had five total wristbands uh but i have the original one which is man it's all coming apart um i've got the bringing the uh, bringing the thunder the the sniffy sniff and then just the regular generic wine library uh wristband got the vaniac shirt doesn't fit as well as it used to but that's okay um so i just wanted to uh I don't know, not really welcome back Gary or congratulate him, but you know, say, hey, thanks for uh, putting out another show uh, recently. Uh, it was great to see you um, at the old desk in the old office, um, which I know is someone else's office now, I guess, but um, it was great to see, uh, see you do that. And um, yeah, anyway, um, so uh, more housekeeping stuff. So I have officially started my studying, uh, actually as, as of this week or the recording this week, uh, with my syllabus. The syllabus takes about 20 some odd weeks that should get me uh, prepared for the Texas, Texas Best Sommelier uh, competition. Now I'm not officially entered into it as of right now, um, but my goal is to enter that and to um, at bare minimum place in it. Um, my goal on the syllabus is to win the competition to help um, uh, redeem myself for my um, incredibly poor performance two years ago. Um, there are 25 competitors. I'm assuming they still keep it at 25. Uh, last year was the first year that they went outside of Texas for competitors. Not that they needed to, but I think it was since it's this conference brings people outside of Texas. I think they try to expand a little bit. So it's no longer the Texas's best comp, uh, Texas's best psalm. It's now Texom best psalm. Um, but you had to live in a state that borders Texas. Um, I'm assuming this year will be the same. Not, you know, I'm not 100% certain on it. They haven't done the application process yet. But my goal is to um, compete in it and not just compete, but to actually place, if not win, the entire enchilada. Um, who would be the first San Antonio uh, person to win it. I'm, I don't know if I'm the first San Antonio person to ever participate in it, but um, there definitely wasn't anybody from San Antonio the year I competed, nor, um, nor last year. However, the year I competed, there was supposed to be another person competing, but he ended up getting a free trip to Napa at the same time, so I don't really blame him. I probably would have done the same thing. So, um, anyway, and... Uh, yeah, he didn't. He didn't try to compete last year, and I, I have no idea if he's going to do it this year. So, um, what what is that competition? That competition is uh, loosely based on the advanced exam, uh, the advanced sommelier exam, and um, uh, it's 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 a close approximation. They don't make it exactly the same, um, but it, it's it's a competition that has the same three elements. Um, and then of theory, tasting, and um, what should we call it? Service. Uh, when I took it, there were only four wines that you were tasting. However, um, you taste six wines at the exam. Um, I know every element has some type of change. One year, they, they tasted you on sparkling wines for the duct of tasting, which is not part of the exam. Uh, so this is a competition. So they're trying to weed out, you know, people that, you know, maybe you have... Maybe if you get like that perfect question on Final Jeopardy of, of, a, of a subject that you know you or you're awesome on 
So maybe, you know, there might be a little bit of luck involved with, um, you know, you might get the right theory questions. You might get the right type of tasting. Maybe, maybe you taste a lot of sparkling wines or you taste a lot of dessert wines or taste a lot of, I don't know, some weird wine from Bulgaria. Um, that that nobody else tastes uh you know service questions can range is is the whole gamut and what you do with service and theory again um the year that i took it um we had some theory questions that were had to do with more distribution um and being a psalm you know like and but it was texas specific you know kind of asking you who who distributes these wines and do you know what the wholesale price is um i don't know what theory was last year's i didn't take it and um but anyway so, uh, and that wasn't the only thing they threw for a loop on the theory question. Um, I won't go through all the details of what theory was in service other than we had four wines and, I'm um, sorry, tasting and service, you know, but if you see, talk to me in person, I'll tell you. Um, and again, it wasn't really anything earth shattering. But um, so I do plan to do that, um, right? This is my, um, I'm not going to get a close up of, this is my tasting grid. Um, I have a mentor. Uh, my my official mentor is Craig Collins, um, and uh, uh, he walked. He worked. Off, he worked with my syllabus um, and made some suggestions on what to change on it. And then um, said, you know, you need to create your own tasting grid so that you know someone's watching you. You know, not on camera, um, but like someone's across the, de the uh, table from me. Um, they can check off that I said all these things because I do have a habit of really going through this really fast. Uh, I can do six wines in under 25 minutes. I just don't hit all the points. I don't show all my work. Um, so that is a, a big problem. That's what I've experienced two years ago. I, I went through the four wines in like, I think we had 17 minutes, uh, 16 plus minutes to do it. And I finished in like 12 or 13 um, because I missed quite a few things to say. So um, anyway, uh, and they tried to tell me that, but they couldn't tell me. <laughs> like, are you sure you're done? That was their way of saying, you may want to review what you said. Um, not that I necessarily got anything wrong. I don't know. I mean, I think I got, I think I did well in identifying things. Um, but uh, yeah, there were things I did not mention. So um, I, my plan is part of my syllabus is every time I do a review is to have this in front, well, hopefully not have it in front of me, but have it in front of me right now just so I cover each area as applicable. Now I do have a version of this sheet that um, I, is more for the novice that has, a, that has no clue what this is all about. Um, and uh, they can circle stuff and they can have, you know, send just a checkbox. They can, it's not really checkbox, but you know, just, it gives them a little more information as to what to listen for when I say stuff. Cause otherwise they'll, they don't know, they may not know that I'm on that section because I'm just talking about, I'm not saying clarity, okay? I'm just saying day bright, star bright, dull, you know, whatever. So, and even then, um, I still need to kind of make sure I do all the stuff. Um, so I probably should have printed the one that had, I probably should have printed the simple one, not the uh, more fill in the blank version. Um, let's see what else. Um, so I haven't finished reading the book because I'm using it for my study material. So as I go through it, um, but this is the new version of the wine Bible by Karen McNeil. Um, it was sent to me for review. Um, I have gone through the book a little bit and I've read a couple of the chapters, um, for studying prior to this week. Um, and, um, it's well written. It's very comprehensive. Um, is this necessarily something that's going to ensure my passage of the advanced sommelier exam? You know, I don't know. This is definitely something that you want to read for intro and certified. Um, it's it's got it's going to have information for advanced. I'm sure. Um, I mean, it's not. I mean, there is no there is no like one thing that assures that you can pass an advanced or, or master exam. It's it's more about you know extending your world of wine and, and, and spirits and beer and all that to a little bit farther than what certified has to do. Master is the entire. Is, is the entire world advanced is, you know, just not quite the entire world, but it's also the depth of the knowledge. So, um, <clears throat> there's probably gonna be, there's, there's stuff in here that I may not have remembered from my studies. Cause it's been three, four years since I've really had to study for an exam. And since I don't use that knowledge, even though I am a Psalm, I don't necessarily use that knowledge daily, um, on every single area of the world. It helps to review everything. Um, I also, 
for the purposes of blind tasting, when I'm visiting, when I'm with somebody, whether it's here or, or elsewhere or whatever, um, you know, everyone has their little ways of like hiding the bottles, you know, paper bags and all these fancy little velvety things. But I have found, as long as you take the capsule off, because you should, I have found that the Corvin sleeve is the perfect, unless you've got some really weird bottle, but this is the perfect blind tasting sleeve. It's, you zip it up, it's, it's, it's nice and compact, it doesn't get crumpled up, you're not gonna rip it. Now the only thing I, you can't, the only thing I haven't done yet is put numbers or letters on these so you can keep everything in the sleeve and so you can go wines one through six, but um, just I think it's just a silver marker will be fine. Um, I almost bought one that had like eight bags and had like this tasting, you know, wine tasting quiz or game or whatever, but I got these. Now I got these off of eBay because you cannot buy these anymore. The ones you can buy from Corvin have a fancy little window so you can see the label. That's great in a home or more in a, in a um, uh, situation like a restaurant where, you know, you're pouring it at a table or pouring it in front of a guest at the bar. They can see the pretty label. I don't need that. So Corvin, please have one verse, have a version of this. I had to go to eBay. Now I bought six of these and I have, of course, the one that came with my unit. So I have seven of them. So I'm good to go. So we'll take that out. I also because if when I go out and about somewhere to do blind tasting, I also bought a little, actually I've never, I haven't even put it in here yet. Does it fit? How does it fit in here? Maybe it fits in like that. There we go. All right, so I bought this, this handy dandy Corvin uh, carrying case. I think I got this off of, actually I think I got it off of eBay also, because it was cheaper than off of Amazon. But I think it's like 20 bucks off of Amazon. Oh, these sleeves, they were $7.77 for a two pack. Awesome. Versus, I think they're like, for the, for the new version, I think they're like, I don't know, for one, they're like 12 bucks or something, or eight bucks, I don't remember. Um, but anyway, the, the little carrying case, you can put two capsules in there. Um, you can fit the Corvin in there. You can't put the base, I don't think. I don't know, I haven't tried it, man. The picture didn't show putting the base in there, but I mean, I get, no. I mean, if you really, really are hard up, I guess you just carry the base, but it doesn't look like it fits in there. Not a big deal. Um, the base really is just kind of nice to have here so I can display it for you guys. But I also leave it in the base when I have it on top of my Palmas, my empty Palmas box. I have to actually buy some of that wine. I've tried it, tasted it. You know, I've, I was there. It's awesome wine. Um, I think that's all the stuff I had wanted to talk about. The book I'd want to talk about like a couple episodes ago. This stuff I just got this last week. So I'm going to talk about that. And let's get into wine. So uh, the first wine. So now for the next couple shows, actually I have a wine I have to need to pick up from UPS today or tomorrow. Um, and I honestly don't know what it is. <laughs> it's been so long since the person said, hey, can I send you wine? I'm like, yeah, sure, send it to me. By the way, um, I don't have it on my website, but my official policy of, of reviewing wine, of stuff that's sent to me is I will review it. I will give an honest review and I will tell people that you sent, not you specifically, but that it was sent to me. Sometimes I'll mention who sent it to me. Sometimes I don't, it's not like I have to. I just have to mention that I either bought the wine or it was given to me by somebody for review purposes. So um, anyway, um, so that's my review policy. You send me wine, um, I will review it at some point in time. Um, realize that I do record some shows. I'm recording two today. I record two to four shows at once. So if you send me some wine and I've already recorded episodes or I've scheduled interviews and I've given the interview person a specific date as to when their show will be up, your product will be reviewed in a timely fashion, um, after, you know, definitely after the recorded shows, because I mentioned show episode, I mentioned episode numbers, and I, you know, I I talk about stuff in the show, so I want the continuity, I want to, whatever, I want it to to work right. I don't want it all of a sudden a show show up and I reference something. Oh, last week and last week was two weeks or three weeks ago. So if you send me wine to review, I will review it, um, and I will tell you when it gets reviewed. 
um, and I will try to review it as soon as I can um, based upon my personal schedule and the show schedule. All right. Um, outside of that, if you want to send me something, email me at mark at 1337wine, 1337wine.com, and then we can discuss that. <clears throat> All right, so wine number one of two wines. This is the 2011 Nardello Suave Classico. Um, it is a white wine produced with 70% Garganega, 30% uh, Trebbiano di Suave um, from the Suave Classico area. I have to have the glass. Good, because where are my pajama bottoms? Beauty of television, though granted, the beauty of audio or writing, you can be totally in your pajamas, but, and don't have to worry about getting up or whatever. So, now obviously for tasting purposes, I already know what this is. This is just, so this, this thing here is just for me to practice. I already, before we started recording. Um, so this is really just for the purposes of making sure I say all these things, but I will be timing myself to um, try to make sure I stay within the four minute, it's four minutes and 10 seconds because you're doing four wines in 25 minutes. I'm sorry, six wines in 25 minutes. I do have gas in there. All right, that's, that should be enough. Um, anyway, so doing, a, you know, I'm gonna stick to the four minutes basically for the wine. And um, you know the best thing about the Corvin stuff is I can reuse these wines for blind tasting. So I don't have to, so it helps with, especially if, you know, if it's a per good example of the area, um, I can reuse it a couple, you know, I don't know, 10 times, maybe not quite 10 times, but at least eight, eight ish times, six, eight times. It saves on costs when you're buying the wine. Um, yes, I do have people that are, you know, help hooking me up and, so, you know, give me samples and I do all that, but um, most, you know, I do have wines that I've purchased. So uh, anyway, so um, Nardello, so they are they're in Italy and um, bu 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 bu. I thought I had, I thought I had a little, how come I had the same thing twice? Man, so I had all these notes I did last night and somehow, some way, It got all messed the F up. Is it gonna launch? Yes, it will. All right, so Nardello, uh, they are a producer. Um, so the Suave Classical region, the Suave region is um, in northeastern Italy. It's near uh, Verona, um, not Veneto. So it's near the Verona area. So I'm trying to get their little history thing going up real quick. Um, there we go. And uh, it is known for make this type of white wine. Um, there, uh, the Nardello the Nardello family's existence dates back to the mid 1500s. Um, they have a notary deed dated the sixth of May, sixteen o eight, put a definite date on the purchase of a of the house in Via for Novembre, the company's current headquarters. Uh, so they've owned that building or at least that property or whatever. Um, and it was sold by the Vernis Bionote, uh, to, L oh, Leonardo, not Leonardo, Leonardo and Zuane, Giovanni Nardello. Okay. Anyway, um, they didn't start making wine. Uh, looks like they're they're more recent in the wine making business, but they've had the property and the uh, had the property for a while. Let's see here. Um, the great the great grandfather uh, Gaetano Maria uh, first started producing wine, followed by grandfather Domenico. Uh, the winery is uh, the winery integrated in inside the country house with the beautiful old yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Gradually, all the old obsolete equipment was scrapped out in the mid-1970s. Our father, uh, Gaetano, Gaeta Gaetano uh, interrupted the winemaking activity to continue with grape cultivation only, taking his harvest to private bottlers. Okay, so... 
I thought there was more information on this. So it looks like in the 2000s, the current generation started making wine for the family. But anyway, they, they've had, they've had the, the building and the property and all that for a very long time. And um, they're making wine for a little bit. So let's go back to all my notes. So Suave, oh, sorry, this was, I purchased this at Underground Cellar for $25. And I think that's the actual price for it. So of course I've got to open up Underground Cellar and look at how much I actually paid for it. So Underground Cellar, while I'm waiting for the website to, or web, the, the, the browser and the website to come up. Uh, Underground Cellar is a place where you can buy um, wines and the the gimmick, and it is a gimmick, but it's, it's a good gimmick, I like it, is that um, <clears throat> you can pay, let's say it was $25, but there's, and as long as you buy at least two bottles of wine, because you buy one bottle, you're gonna, get, you're gonna get the $25 bottle of wine. But if you buy at least two bottles, um, you have a chance of one of those bottles, and if you buy three or four or five bottles, you have more upgrades. But you have at least the you have at least the guarantee that one of the bottles will be an upgraded bottle. Now that could be the next level up, or it could be the very top level. I mean, I've seen I've seen you know offers where you paid twenty bucks for you know there was the, to get in was twenty dollars to buy in because it's very much like gambling. I know you can't really call it gambling, um, but um, <clears throat> Come on, connect. But the um, the buy-in say is twenty bucks, and for right now they they have a French fine French rosé, just twenty dollars to get you a two hundred twenty-five dollar bottle. Okay, so now the way it works, so we're gonna go over there, or sixty-five dollars could get you a bottle worth eleven $1 hundred bucks. Okay, so I've seen you know crazy crazy deals like that. Now how they're getting these bottles, I don't know, but they look I think they have some some deals. So in this case, they have Fry and French Rosé. There's four bottles that um, are part of the offer. You have a $20 bottle, you have a $28 bottle, you have a $35 bottle, and then you have a bottle that's worth $225. Now, and they even tell you what percentage of the bottles are part of the deal. So the $20 bottle is 35.5% of those bottles. That the next level up 28 bottles, or $28, is 49.7%. So you so as long as you buy an upgrade, you know, two bottles, you you have a good chance of getting a $28 bottle and a $20 bottle, but you only spend 40 bucks on it, plus shipping and all that. The $35 bottle is 14.2% of the bottles, and uh, the $225 bottle is 0.59% of the bottles. So most likely, um, and they said there's less than 100 bottles left right now. So you could, I mean, I, I've done it where I've, especially when an offer is kind of new, um, like the first few hours of an offer, I've, I've looked at how many bottles are left. Sometimes they'll tell you exactly uh, how many bottles are left, and you look at the order history, see how many bottles everybody purchased, and you can even look at their cloud sellers to see if they got the uber awesome bottle or not. Um, and then you can also kind of figure out how many, how many um, bottles are actually available of the top bottle initially and how much is left. So um, but that's a lot of work just to go, hey, just buy, just buy the wine. Because the chance of you, of you scoring that is really small, but someone's gonna get it. Anyway, um, so I do buy actually a lot of my wine from them. And uh, uh, I just like the deal you get. I mean, I'm pretty much spending at least 20 to 40 bucks for, you know, per bottle for wine, but um, I've gotten some wines, you know, where, come on, man, I already signed in. Um, I've, you know, I've spent, you know, 20 bucks and gotten a 60 or 70 or $80 bottle. So I, I, I enjoy that you get some good stuff out of it. And yeah, some of these are, you know, some of these are wines that, you know, the winery's just trying to get rid of. Not that it's bad wine, it's just they're overstocked on it. You know, this is a, this is a, this is a 2011, it's 2016 right now. And I bought this, I think, in 2015, early 2015. So at the time it was a four year old um, bottle of wine. Matter of fact, I'll tell you exactly when I bought this bottle of wine. Um, I purchased this wine on April 19th of 2015. So almost not quite a year ago or yeah. So 
What? Is that right? 19. Yeah, 15, sorry. I was like, it's not 2019 yet. So yeah, so I bought it a year ago. So it was a four-year-old bottle of white wine. You know, probably a good idea to, to drink this wine now. Um, so on this particular day, this offer was an $18 offer. So I was charged $36 for two bottles. So I only paid 18 for this and it's normally 22. Did I say it was 22? How come it says 25 there? Being your turbian, am I looking? Yeah. I don't know why I have 25 down. It is, I paid 18 for it and it's normally, normally, try and get these notes in here so I type all this stuff in here. Normally $22. Okay. So uh, Suave um, itself uh, saw a peak in popularity in the United States during the mid 20th century. Um, there was an Italian wine boom at the time um, after World War II. Um, driven by marketing efforts by producers like Bola, uh, Suave even surpassed Chianti in the 70s as the largest selling Italian DOC wine in the U.S. By the end of the 20th century, Suave's share of U.S. sales were eventually eclipsed by Pinot Grigio uh, and an influx of new wines from southern Italy. Anyway, so let's get into the wine itself. I've got my timer set for four minutes. And uh, I will try to go through the grid. Let's go through the grid. Let's talk about the grid real quick. So grid is divided into a few sections. You have sight, nose, palate, initial conclusion, and final conclusion. Now within sight, you have to talk about the clarity, the brightness, the concentration, the color, the hue, rim variation, extract or staining of the glass, a viscosity, also known as tears, uh, evidence of any gas, and then you have sediments or any particles in the wine. Um, in the nose, you need to say whether it's clean or has a fault. What kind of fault is it? Uh, intensity, age assessment, um, like just is it youthful or is it vinous? Um, or, you know, is it, does it smell like it has some age to it? You don't have to get too, too specific at that point. Fruit and fruit character, um, non-fruit uh, aromas, earth, mineral um, aromas, organic and then inorganic, and then um, are you getting any evidence of wood? Oh, speaking of that, I don't mean to be snarky sometimes, um, but I had someone that gave me a little snarky comment on a YouTube video they watched uh, yesterday. Uh, today is Friday the 26th, so they watched it on the 25th of February, and um, their comment was, Lots of wood from 100% stainless steel, eh? I was like, I don't know. I've called stuff really weird before and on the show and realized I made a mistake and you've seen me put the lower third up. I've also done things where I've done wine tasting and being completely off or you know, in, in evaluate wine in front of other people and I'm coming up with stuff and all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, it has wood. I'm like, oh wow, didn't know I had wood or go the way around. Um, so I was like, okay, well, this is a, this is a show from like four years ago, and um, not not say that it wasn't experienced enough to be able to tell if there was wood or not in a wine, but um, I was like, all right, well, let me look up the wine. Yes, as a matter of fact, it was aged for six months in American oak. Anyway, I just felt vindicated that I actually was right, you know, and the guy was coming coming across as being, you know. I think that's what it was like. He's come across as knowing that this wine had no oak for sure. Like, man, if it doesn't have oak, man, that's cool. I get it. And, you know, it's the internet and you have to have a thick skin. People are going to hate on you. But I was like, yes, as a matter of fact, it does have wood matured for six months in American oak directly from the website and put a link to the wine from the website. So he didn't reply back. All right, so, uh, well, hold on, I'm supposed to start the timer when I touch the glass. Whoops. All right, let's get going. Wine number one, oh, it's always gonna be wine number one, uh, is a white wine. It is uh, clear, no evidence of any gas or sediments. Um, it is a yellow color, um, yellow throughout, and um, not a whole lot of rim variation. It's not quite to a watery rim, but there's a little bit of rim variation. Um, I don't see any other type of colors other than yellow. Um, 
No staining on the glass. Being a white wine usually does not do that. Um, viscosity tears. Viscosity is, and maybe if my wine glass was cleaner or cleaned better, I could get some type of viscosity on it. Tearing. Um, inconclusive, which is not a good sign or not a good thing to say. All right, uh, on the nose. It is clean, uh, no evidence of faults. It is of a moderate intensity. Uh, does I, I wouldn't necessarily know if it smelled youthful or not at this point. It's obviously not a youthful wine. But um, on the nose, I mean, it, it smells clean. There's no intensity, you know, low intensity. It could be Venice um, fruit characters. So I get um, melon, cantaloupe, cantaloupe rind. Um, I don't really get any other type of evidence of other fruits right now as far as non-fruit. Meaning floral or things like that. I don't really get any floral out of it. I don't really get any earthiness of an organic or inorganic nature. I am struggling with the nose. It is very closed. I don't get a whole lot out of it. Um, I don't even get, you know, you would think with a white wine, you might get some steely or slate or, you know, stony character. I don't get any of that. As far as wood, and this is where I didn't see um, on the website if it has any wood maturity. I don't think it has any wood maturity. I don't get any evidence of wood on the nose. All right, palette. We didn't talk about the whole palate side, but anyway, um, on the palate, it is dry. Um, I would call it bone dry. Um, does not have any tannins. Uh, acidity is, I would call it medium plus. Alcohol is medium. Body texture. It's a light-bodied wine, um, not much grip. There might be a little bit of, might be a tad bit of grip. So that's not necessarily tannin. Well, there would be tannin, but um, but there's probably very little skin contact on it. Uh, then for the flavor elements, pretty much what you're going to say is, does it does it mirror the palate? So yes, on fruit, non-fruit, earth, and everything, everything um, confirms the, the the palate confirms the nose. Uh, on the palate, I do not get any evidence of wood. The, the wine is balanced. Um, acid acid is one of the one of the more prominent elements, but it is um, it is balanced with the uh, flavor and all that. Alcohol. So I am already at four minutes, and I haven't even gotten to initial conclusion. Part of it is I'm taking a long time analyzing this. I made me made a comment or two, um, but I'm I was getting to balance. I saw a length and finish complexity, quality of producer, which should have taken 10 seconds. And then initial conclusion, final conclusion, these things also should take no more than about 30 seconds uh, total, um, unless you're really stumped. So that tells you right there the, the, the detail of what you gotta go through with the grid, all right? Um, so let's finish. Um, like I said balance, it's, I would say it's, it's, the acid does seem to kind of predominate. Um, I don't really get anything other than the, the cantaloupe and melon. Uh, complexity, uh, length finish, um, short. Uh, quality of producer complexity, com it's not very, um, it's not a very complex wine. It's okay. It's a white wine. It's, you know, we already know what it is. So complexity doesn't necessarily mean it's got to be great. Uh, quality producer, I mean, it, it does taste like it was a, it's a well-made wine. Um, there's no faults in it. 
Um, it's got good flavor. I mean, it's not intense, um, but it's also not, um, um, it's not, uh, you know, watery thin. Um, oh yeah, I have a twice quality producer. So then we go new world, old world, and this is where you have to know your theory and make sure you can really identify why it's new world and old world. So things like high acid, not necessarily um, high alcohol, that should indicate a cool climate. Cool climates can be anywhere in the world. It's not, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. But when you start talking about your flavor profiles, um, you start in your head, you start kind of thinking about what kind of wines it could be, what grapes it could be. You haven't really started saying, you might start saying stuff. You can say, well, this indicates possibly Chardonnay or Pinot Grigio or whatever. Um, I don't have enough experience with Suave to even start guessing that it's a Suave. I would probably say this is a Pinot Grigio or a, um, a Chardonnay, a Ch specifically Chablis Chardonnay. Um, though when I was doing my blind tasting in front of one of the masters, I said a Burgundy or Chablis, and, he, and then afterwards he goes, that tells me you don't know what you're talking about. I was like, but I meant, he goes, I know what you meant, but when you're saying these things, you wanna be careful what you say. So I'm also very, very bad habit of saying, it's maybe this, like this, whatever, you know, so be definitive in what you say about your, your descriptions so that um, you're not, coming across as uncertain as to what you're tasting. If you taste it, say it. If you don't taste it, don't say it. Or if you don't taste it, say you don't taste it. Don't be like, well, it kind of has like this, maybe this, I'm not really sure. That starts making the masters in front of you think that, you don't, that you're just kind of BSing your way through it. Um, which, yes, some of this might be a little BSing, you're trying, because you're really, you might be grasping at straws, but um, try to be very confident in your tasting and only identify the stuff you can identify. And if, if there's something specifically not in it, say it's not in there, okay? Um, so this is where you come up with, well, I think it's either old world, new world. Well, we know it's old world, so we'll say it's old world. The climate, it is a cool climate because of, why? Uh, then you come up with uh, two to three possible grape varieties or say it's a blend of grapes. Um, like in this case, if I say it could be a suave because so it's a blend of grapes. Um, it could be, you know, this, that, the other. Um, you can say it's a, a white Bordeaux because it has this, that, and the other. So, and then what countries it could be. So, so you might say, well, it's Chardonnay, it's Pinot Grigio. It's this, well, if it's, so if you're talking about grapes, you need to, what countries? And if you say it's old world, you better use old world countries. So Italy, all right. Uh, age range. Well, we've said earlier that it may taste the, the, on the nose. It, it doesn't have that. It doesn't seem to be youthful. The color also can give you indication of, of if it's if it's getting darker or deeper, um, and and you're as you're tasting it and smelling it, it doesn't con conform with a with a color is due to anything other than age. Like if it's the wood treatment, uh, the actual grape tends to have a certain type of of uh, color to it as you're going through it. And then your final conclusion. So then you come up with the vintage. So I, if I would say this is three to five years, so I would say, well, this is 2011, if I'm gonna be correct. Uh, grape variety or blend, well, I'm gonna say this is a suave. And then I, if I'm gonna be you know, super awesome, I might say, with the, which is majority of Garganega, um, and then plus other grapes, which you know, I'm not gonna be able to tell what they are. Um, and then of course, say country of origin, you say it's Italy, region, Appalachian, Suave, if you wanna get even more, say I believe this is a high quality producer or a, qual or, or a good quality producer um, in a Classico region. And um, that's when you're saying quality, you know, Classico and DOC and all that. That is what it is, that's, that's the grid. So what I think about the wine, um, you know, it's an easy drinking wine. Um, it's like, it's not very complex. Um, I don't get anything other than, you know, still five, six, seven minutes later, I'm still getting the same aromas that I had before. It's pleasant. Um, the acidity, so sometimes what I call it, sometimes if something has a high, high acidity, I start saying, well, it has lemon lime in it. Sure. But it's still more of a melon type of, of um, uh, quality to it. Um, <clears throat> I would probably equate it to something like Pinot Grigio. Okay. Um, it's very similar to Pinot Grigio. Um, it's $22, but it's a good wine. It's nice. Um, it's different. Has It's not quite Pinot Grigio. So if you want something that's a little bit, I feel a little more 
flavor than your typical Pinot Grigio, but then again, at $20, Pinot Grigio shouldn't taste like the $6 Pinot Grigios, which are, you know, very bland or whatever, one dimensional. I'm not saying this is complex either, but it's a good wine. It's pleasant, easy drinking, refreshing. Um, at $18, I think it was really good. At $22, it's only $4 more. It's like still all right, still a okay deal. Um, it is six years old at this point on, you know, as it, so it's not like it's going to be, you know, fresh, as fresh as it would have been if I had bought the thing in 2012 or 13, but um, it's still drinking just fine. Okay. You're not going to throw it out. So it's good wine. If you find it out there, you want to check it out. Um, hopefully it's a, a more recent vintage, so it'll probably taste a little bit fresher and uh we're good to go on that. All right, so let's go to wine number two and let's evacuate the air out of that. All right, wine number two. This is the uh, Chile, uh, wait, 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 Chile, Chile, a, I practiced this last night and I had the actual pronunciation. Thank you, Jeremy Parzin. Um, dobianchi.com. Uh, he has some videos of Italian wine pronunciations. Chile e Giolo. Chile e Giolo. Okay. Um, from Sassotondo. Um, Chile e Giolo is the main grape variety. Got it also for... What in the world? That is just weird. It, it like... It like repeated what I typed... Okay, let me look up how much I spent on it because it says 18, spent 18, normally 22, and it said something different. So, one note, you're weird. All right. That's why, because when I typed in how much this is, it changed the other one. It's not copy and pasting. It's just like weird. So, this is $25. I pay $25 for it. I mean, it's a normally $25 wine. I got another wine uh, for $35. Or that I got another one that normally sells for $35 in the same deal. And I bought this in Dece December 18th, 2014. Oh, I forgot to say what the year was. 2012. All right, so um, Sassotondo is the typical vineyard of this area of Alter Marema, Toscana. So uh, this area of Tuscany is a little bit farther south. Um, it's getting closer to the coast. Um, anyway, uh, where permanent cultures, grapevines, and olives flank the extensive pastures and woods, the organic farm, 72 hectares, um, 11 are vineyards. 11 hectares are vineyards. <clears throat> this is difficult to pull up. Sit between the towns of Serrano, uh, Petiliano on the edge of the volcanic basin of Bolsena, the Tufo or volcanic rock. Let's move this over here. Makes up everything. Uh, the vines grow from it. It is used to build houses and the wine caves and all that other stuff. Okay. So um, it is 80% uh, Chile e Jolo, 10% uh, Alicante, and 10% Sangiovese. Sangiovese. Uh, several months in stainless steel, then three months refined in bottles. So this is one of those, if I go tons of wood, like I said, the other wine, I might be wrong. Um, so that's really weird how it did that. All right, so let's, let's go through it. We're gonna set my timer again to try to get through this in four minutes. Here we go. All right, this is a red wine. It shows no evidence of gas. They used to say flocculation too, you know, in one of the things. Gas or, or sediment. Um, it is uh, opaque. Uh, it is, uh, I wouldn't really call it bright. Um, nor would I call it dull, I don't know. Uh, on the color, it is, wow, it is, uh, I would call it, call it garnet. Um, very little rim variation to the edge, but very slight rim, rim variation. 
um, does not have a whole lot of staining on the glass. It's, it's light staining on the glass. Looks like I have um, some cork in there. Um, now that we've coated the glass with the white wine, let's see if I can get any viscosity. Ah, viscosity is low. Um, nose. On the nose, I get red fruits. Uh, it is clean, no evidence of any faults. It is of moderate intensity. Um, so 2012, it probably would still be considered younger. Um, but on the nose, it doesn't come across as necessarily youthful, but we will call it youthful. I get red fruits, uh, a bit of smokiness. I might say that I get wood, but this also could be the stems. And that was something that um, I heard in, I learned in one of the podcasts recently is that stems can give a wine a wood character that people think come from wood barrels. So this could be a whole cluster thing. They could have left the stems in there. But it's not very, it's not overpowering, I, you know. Maybe it smells like wood and not like, you know, the characteristics that wood give you. It has a bit of savoriness to it. Um, so savory is a little bit, it's a little bit, but that can be called, you know, Syrah, but meat quality. I do get, I do get qualities of smoked meat, beef jerky. And if I was talking about wood, I would probably think that there was wood on it, but it was very slight, you know, neutral barrels. It was probably what I would call it, not knowing it's actually stainless. All right, on the palate. The one is bone dry. Um, tannins are high. Acid is medium plus. Um, alcohol, I don't, doesn't feel very hot, so I'm going to call it medium minus, and we got to review that because I reviewed the alcohol on this too. Um, tannins are really gripping on, on the gums. Um, I do get, um, and its body is, I would call it medium, medium bodied. Um, palate does confirm the nose, but I also get, I get olives green olives specifically so we're talking about the olives there so i'm pretty and it might be because i'm looking for it but i get green olives like for days um so that savoriness that meat get you know smoked meats um beef jerky that kind of thing um the fruit character really has not come through a lot this is very um uh, non-fruit driven so again we're at four minutes and i've gone over um But I do get um, yeah, that red fruits don't really get a whole lot of red fruits. I don't get very much fruit at all. As um, far as any other earth or, or non-fruit characteristics. Um, I don't get any type of floral. I don't get anything else other than really just like a lot of smoked meat and I get the olives and Again, I do feel like I taste some wood to it, but again, that doesn't mean it's oak, you know, or, or oak bear or wood barrels. Um, as far as evidence of wood, I don't have anything that tells me it's been aged in any type of uh, wood barrel that, that's gonna interact with the wine. Um, again, I'm not used to red wines being, you know, everything being stainless and they let it, they let mature in stainless and then go back to bottle, but it does happen, right? Uh, balance. I think it's a fairly balanced wine. Um, uh, the finish is long. Like, I'm still tasting it. Um, complexity, I would call this a um, 
moderately complex uh, wine. There's not a whole lot this is going on. I mean, like I said, it's it's I got a couple big flavors. Um, the tannin um, is is definitely big, um, but it doesn't feel like anything. One aspect is completely overpowering everything, um, but it could could use a little tweaking on the EQ. Um, is it complex? Moderately complex. Um, it does taste like it came from a quality producer. Um, and at this point, then I would say old world, new world, blah, blah, blah. This is also another one that I probably would not get, okay, on the advanced exam. It could be a master level exam. They may want me to identify something from this part because, because the, um, uh, this part of, the, of Italy, the um, Chile Ajolo, um, Chile Ajolo grape is um, going to be pretty uh, predominant in this part of Tuscany. Um, now, so besides going through the rest of the, the grid, do I like the wine? Yeah, I like the wine. This is going to be good, some good stuff. This is going to be a wine I'm going to drink and not hold back for a blind tasting because, again, it's not something I'm going to be testing on probably. But yes, this is a good wine. And for 25 bucks, it's it's well priced. I don't think it's anything crazy. Um, it's as good as any other Tuscan wine for the for the same $25. It's just that instead of it being predominantly Sangiovese, it is Chile Giolo. Chile Giolo. Something like that. I don't know. All right. That's going to do it for this episode. Um, 350, it's somewhat of a significant number. I didn't do anything really high end or cool other than like props out to Gary. Um, I had thought about doing a blind tasting episode. Um, but after my dismal failure recently on some of my blind tastings, um, I decided I didn't want to embarrass myself. So, uh, anyway. Uh, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, as always, click the links above to friend me up. Hit the donate button over there. You can send a few ducats to uh, allow me to buy some wine. Um, if you're watching on iTunes, uh, on your iPhone or iPad or computer or Apple TV or whatever type of podcasting app, but if you're watching it from iTunes, please uh, leave some five-star reviews, and that way I get a little more love on iTunes. Um, I'm trying to figure out why I can't. I'm trying to figure out how to get video wine review, all three of those words and every permutation I can get to be part of it. Because when you type in wine review, I, I, I am there, but I'm not really high up. That's more about ratings. But video wine review, I don't even appear in that type of list. As a matter of fact, it's Ask Gary V shows up. And he doesn't even do really wine on those Ask Gary V episodes. It's really you ask him a question. But he has done wine from time to time or mentioned it. So I don't know how I'm, I, I need to figure out how my, my keywords need to be set up because um, supposedly I can do it, but the app, the, uh, the little plugin I use for, from Blueberry, I don't see the, I don't see the keyword listing anymore. And I'm pretty sure it was there before. So I know iTunes had some changes and they did some changes recently. So maybe their FAQs and, and, and guides aren't up to date. I'll have to um, email them. But uh, anyway, so leave me leave me some good positive comments in there. If you're hopefully you're watching on TiVo, which I don't I still don't know how that works. If you if you watch on TiVo, let me know how it works because I don't have a TiVo. I can't use one because of our uh, the cable system that we have. I can't even buy one to try it out. Check me on Roku, YouTube, uh, iFood.tv, which is where I'm on Roku or YouTube or you know any of those other uh, connected devices. You know, watch me there. And uh, tell your friends about it and leave comments below. That's it. We'll see everyone again next time.